I have a message specifically for cis white women allies, okay? I wasn't gonna be so specific. Polyromantic is a sexuality that describes being romantically attracted to multiple genders. When I do my spiritual readings, people know that it's a female mind's eye on the other end. Hey everybody, I'm Brad Palumbo and welcome back to the Damage Control Podcast where we are reclaiming the LGBT community from the insane people who've taken it over. Today, we're talking about an insane journalistic scandal with CNN's coverage of trans issues, plus LGBT activists are actually mad at the Biden administration and the craziest transgender athlete story I've seen today. And as always, I'll round out the show by reacting to some unhinged TikToks from the alphabet people and suffering for your entertainment. If you're new here, please do consider subscribing and sticking around. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment with your thoughts as we go along, and now let's get into it. So up first, we have to talk about this story by a reporter who, you know, I'm a big fan of. He does a lot of good work. Uh, he's on the liberal side, but he covers these issues honestly and fairly. And his name is Jesse Single. He just dropped a report on his Substack, which I will link to in the description, highlighting how CNN has effectively been copy and pasting misinformation, frankly, about the ethics and efficacy of transgender uh, med medical transitioning into its reporting over and over again. And honestly, my, my expectations for mainstream media are pretty low at this point, but I was still surprised at some of the stuff that he uncovered. So let's take a look at that. Jesse reports that yesterday, and this is a little bit outdated now, but CNN published an article by senior writer Tara John about the UK National Health Service's newly skeptical stance towards youth gender medicine. The main takeaway, which is big news to observers of this debate, is that the NHS will no longer provide puberty blockers to young people other than in research contexts. As for cross-sex hormones, a relatively strict-seeming regime is set to be implemented, and they will only be offered to youth from around their 16th birthday. Jesse goes on to say, As myself and a number of others pointed out, the article contains a sentence that is, in context, rather wild. John writes, quote, Gender-affirming care is medically necessary, evidence-based care that uses a multidisciplinary approach to help a person transition from their assigned gender, the one that was designated at birth, to their affirmed gender the gender by which one wants to be known. But of course, whether youth gender medicine is medically necessary and evidence-based is exactly the thing being debated. And anyone who has been following this debate closely knows that every national health system that has examined this question closely, including the NHS, has come to the same conclusion. The evidence is paltry. So it's very strange to see the sentence, which reads as though it comes from an activist press release published in a news article in CNN, an outlet that generally adheres to the old school divide between news and opinion. Yeah, so the sentence that he highlights there is just really not accurate. If you're familiar with the debate over this stuff and the research and the literature, and nobody's really reported on it better than Jesse. And how does something that inaccurate end up in a news article? It's a question worth asking, right? Are they just inserting talking points they're getting from one of these LGBT activist organizations who repeats ad nauseum, safe and effective, it's safe and effective, it's medically proven, all the data, all the research, all these things that we know aren't true. They've never been true, but they've just repeated it so much that a lot of people just take it for granted that it is the case. So Jesse went down this rabbit hole and he actually found that not only did this inaccurate and misleading language about this highly charged topic appear in one CNN article, he found 35 CNN articles with this exact sentence copied and pasted. Jesse writes, it would be bad enough for this sentence to have appeared in one article on one of the most important news websites in the world. But here's the thing. This wasn't the first time. Rather, this exact sentence and close variants of it has been copied and pasted into dozens of CNN.com stories over the last few years as a Google search quickly reveals. So he put it in a sub stack and I'll link to it more if you want to read the whole thing. Go check it out. Highly recommend that you sign up. Anyway, he found 35 articles about this topic that have all just had that activist mantra copied and pasted verbatim and stated as fact. Folks, this is not journalism. This is not normal. This is propaganda. One, as Jesse pointed out in this article, the statement is false, so it should really be retracted or corrected even just if a journalist had written it in one article. But to have the same sentence 
over and over and over again in all their reporting suggests that they are literally giving talking points to copy and paste into their articles. I have worked in journalism. I call myself a recovering journalist. I still do some stuff that falls under the journalism umbrella, but I'm also, you know, a content creator and doing lots of other things. But I worked at publications and that's not how it works. I've never pasted in standard copy language about a contentious topic or any topic into an article I'm writing. You're supposed to do your own research and your own writing and your own thoughts and check your own facts, not just copy and paste stuff. It's really quite something. I have serious questions for the journalists that went along with this because this is not normal. It's normal, guys, to have like a style guide, right? So you'll have things that you do as an institution, for example, do you shorten senator to S-E-N dot, right? Do you write out numbers or do you put the numerals? Like there's these kinds of things. It's normal to have standard at a publication and then you uh, put them throughout your article and you uh, change and adjust them as needed. But standard language and talking points inserted to articles about a topic that even if they were accurate, that would not really be journalism, right? You're not supposed to be copy and pasting other people's words and putting it under your byline with no explanation or quotation marks or anything. But especially when it's something that's not even factually accurate. What? This is CNN. This is one of the biggest media outlets in all of American media, just with the, the standards absolutely through the basement floor. It's a really bizarre indictment of modern journalism, but it also shows to me how much activism and journalism have become melded into one on these hot button topics. And that's really not good. Even if it was right wing activism, I still wouldn't support it, right? Because journalists, especially news reporters, opinion columnists, it's a little bit different. But these reporters are supposed to be presenting people with the facts and then people can draw their own conclusions. But when they're giving you a skewed and warped perception of the facts that they've just gotten apparently spoon fed to them by activists and then copy and pasted from a talking point database into dozens of articles that I'm sure racked up millions and millions of views, that is a propaganda machine. That is not anything resembling journalism or ethical information gathering and communication to the world. It's a complete complete dereliction of their duty to the public. And honestly, I also question the authors of these articles. Like, why would they go along with this? Why would they put stuff into their articles that's not true or they haven't fact checked it or that isn't their words? It's just been copied and pasted in maybe by an editor. Why aren't you speaking out? Why aren't you saying don't do that? Or I won't have that in my article. And actually, you know, taking a stand and, and having some principles and some ethics is any any job really worth just being a propaganda mouthpiece. I mean, imagine if something like this came about, <laughs> came out about like a Fox News or something, right? It would be everywhere how it's just a propaganda factory. And you know what? That criticism would be kind of legit. Honestly, it, it would be legitimate. So look, CNN, this is not a good look for y'all. You really need to clearly delineate between activism and journalism. And uh, shout out to Jesse Single for, for this reporting, because this is the kind of thing that nobody would have noticed if not for somebody like him dig digging it up. So check out his Substack and be sure to sign up to it. I will link it in the show notes. Up next, LGBT activists are actually mad at President Biden right now over a supposed ban on pride flags. Let's dig into it. So we've got reporting here from The Advocate, that LGBT activist website, and they say the Biden administration has agreed to ban and LGBTQ plus pride flags from flying at U.S. embassies in order to pass a spending bill that will keep the federal government open through September 30th. Flag bans have been proposed and enacted by conservatives across the country as a way to censor specifically the rainbow pride flag. The federal measure was stuck into the government spending agreement by Republicans during negotiations and enthusiastically promoted by anti-LGBTQ House Speaker Mike Johnson. The provision bans all flags other than the U.S. flag outside embassies, but it does not prevent individual workers from displaying them. The measure aimed to crack down on all, quote, political flags, including the Black Lives Matter flag or the Black American heritage flags. There are only exceptions for flags honoring prisoners of war and wrongful detainees. So hold on a second. <laughs> Remember from the headline? This is just such a good example of how the activist media, the headline and then the reality are pretty different. <laughs> 
It was a ban on pride flags at the embassies, right? Well, no, actually, incorrect. It turns out it's a ban on all flags, any flags except the American flag and flags honoring prisoners of war. In no other context would we call that a a ban on just a certain flag that falls under that umbrella. Even though you look, it might be true that some of the Republicans who were introducing this were not happy with the fact that the pride flag was being flown at embassies and that was their motivation. But you still can't call it a pride flag ban if it's just a flag ban, right? This means that a Republican administration can't put the don't tread on me flag up. Like it is a uniform across the board restriction. So I'm okay with that. I don't know about y'all, but even as an LGBT person, the only flag that I, I feel strongly needs to be flying at U.S. embassies is an American flag. It represents all of us, all Americans from all walks of life. I wouldn't be okay with it if they were just singling out the pride flag or if they were telling like workers that you're not allowed to display it in your office or in a a pin on your uniform or whatever, because I believe in freedom of speech, but they're not doing that. That's all still allowed. So this just seems like much ado about nothing, to be honest. But that's kind of par for the course for these LGBT activists. They love to kick up a fuss about stuff that's either not what they say it is or is ultimately relatively inconsequential. It's also hilarious to me that they were actually mad at Joe Biden over this, as if he was supposed to hold up the funding for the entire federal government and possibly cause a government shutdown over pride flags and all flags other than the U.S. flag not being allowed to be flown at embassies. Seriously, (laughs) y'all? They seriously wanted him to do that? It wasn't enough for them. So the advocate goes on to report that President Joe Biden has endorsed the government funding bill with his office saying in a statement that it strongly urges swift passage of the critical bill. He has since denounced the flag ban as a White House spokesperson told the advocate that President Biden believes it was inappropriate to abuse the process that was essential to keep the government open by including this policy targeting LGBTQI plus Americans. Um, So a couple thoughts there. One more claptrap from the White House. It's not targeting LGBTQI plus Americans because it literally applies to all Americans and all flags. It's not just the pride flag. So shocker, they're saying some stuff that's not true to push their political narrative. But also, why to defend Biden for a minute? Why are any of these alphabet activists mad at him. He literally didn't do anything wrong. He didn't support this being in there, but once it was in there and it was delivered and he's not going to hold up funding the whole government over this one tiny provision that you can't have a rainbow flag at the front flying over a US embassy overseas. You can still to be clear have these flags even on display inside the embassy or whatever. You just can't fly it outside above the embassy only the American flag or flags honoring prisoners of war can go up there. You really are LGBT activists really so out of touch. They wanted to hold up the government's funding over that. Look, I'm somebody who's always down to criticize Biden, but there's no reason to be mad at him there. He just seems to be uh, actually prioritizing the right thing for once. Anyway, though, that story is just another reminder for me that whenever you see these headlines, Republicans ban pride flags and Biden goes along with it. Remember, the devil's always in the details and the reality versus the headline is often starkly different, especially when it comes to LGBT issues. For some reason, they are just so routinely and so regularly reported in this hyperbolic and inaccurate and misleading way. And it's a real shame because it has people convinced that things are worse than they are and that more is at stake than it actually is. And that just serves to raise the national temperature and leave us all more anxious and more stressed. Up next, this has to be one of the craziest stories I've seen in the whole arena of transgender athletes competing in women's sports. And we've seen some crazy stuff, but this might just take the cake. We've got reporting here from the New York Post in this headline. (laughs) I can't even read it without laughing. Australian soccer team with five transgender players goes undefeated in women's tournament. Quote, huge difference in ability. (laughs) Five. The 
Post reports, an amateur Australian soccer team has stirred up controversy after the squad, which includes five transgender women, dominated a women-only tournament and claimed the $1,000 prize, according to a report. The Sydney-based Flying Bats FC went undefeated during the four-week tournament, including one game in which one of the transgender women scored six goals (laughs) en route to a 10-0 beatdown. The Daily Telegraph reported some parents pulled their daughters from matches over safety concerns. Officials from other soccer clubs in the Northwest Sydney League told the paper they believe the Flying Bats, who are backed by Pride Football Australia, should instead play in the mixed gender games that include men and women. Our girls are here to play for fun and expect to play in the female competition. They did not sign up for a mixed competition, one senior club official said. Some of the parents were so concerned they wouldn't let their daughters play. The official continued, it was so disheartening for them to see the huge difference in ability. They're killing it. So before I get to the rest of the reporting here, I got to tell you guys just about how crazy this is as a lifelong soccer fan and a lifelong soccer player. 10-0 is unheard of in a single match. That's like almost never happens. Six goals, one player scoring six goals in one match again almost unheard of i mean they have something called a hat trick when you score three goals and that's considered like a huge deal and it doesn't happen super often that one player does that uh but six a double hat trick my gosh people this is just totally wild however the story gets even crazier when we get into some more of the details again this reporting from the post reads Kiralee Smith, a spokesperson for Binary Australia, an advocacy group that maintains there are only two genders, told the Daily Telegraph that the league is putting the players at risk. She claimed that some girls were told not to complain or forfeit in protest for fear of repercussions. Oh, good. Lovely. So now we're not just taking away women's sports and fairness and access and honestly endangering their safety, we're also silencing them and bullying them. Not only will you allow males to compete in your competition and beat you 10-0 and take away money, it's not even just the sake of the competition, it's a prize money from you unfairly, you will also shut up and you will just do it without a word or you'll be canceled, you'll face repercussions. How lovely, oh my, how lovely guys. But the club, this club with the five transgender players, is just standing by this and insisting they did nothing wrong. Back to the post here. The Flying Bats football club president, Jen Peden, defended the club's tournament victory and said the team stands for inclusion because, quote, trans women belong in the women's competition because that is the gender with which they identify. As a club, the Flying Bats FC stand strongly for inclusion and pride ourselves on safe, respectful, and fair play. The promotion of a supportive community for LGBTQIA plus parent layers, officials, supporters, and the significant physical, social, and mental health benefits that participation in sport brings, especially to marginalized members of the LGBTQIA plus community. We are a club that values our cisgender and transgender players equally. And even the league is standing by this, not just the team at question. A spokesperson for Football NSW told the Daily Telegraph that the league takes pride, quote, in being at the forefront of developing inclusive policies for the sport in Australia and operates within the existing legal framework, including anti-discrimination legislation. You guys, I feel like I'm losing my mind. I feel like I'm losing it. Five males in one soccer team, and they're just dominating the women's competition, destroying them 10-0. And they're saying, yeah, nothing to see here. It's fine. We stand for diversity and inclusion and fairness and safety. What about fairness and safety for the women players? It's not safe in an intense, serious competition with prize money on the line to have males and females intermingling, especially when that's not what the female players signed up for. Again, I just end up feeling like I'm going crazy because it wasn't very long ago that the liberal feminist types were the ones demanding the importance and necessity of having a separate league for females <laughs> because women need access to sports. They need, it needs to be fair. They need a safe way they can play with other women. And now these, these same types are the ones just running a bulldozer over all of that. If you guys watch or listen to this show, you know, despite what haters might say, I am not somebody 
who is transphobic. I'm not somebody with any animosity towards trans people or any desire to control their lives or stop them from living their best lives however they see fit, doing whatever they want to do with their doctor, living how they live. I'll, I'll even accommodate it within reason and use pronouns and other stuff. It's really no skin off my back. But I will speak out against this insanity. One, because I find it just unfair and dangerous and offensive to women. And I feel I feel compelled to speak out that that harm is being done in the name of my community. And two, because even in the interest of the transgender people that I know and like and respect, we got to stop this. There is no better recipe in the world for a massive backlash against the trans community and the whole LGBT community than stuff like this. And I like covering stories from Australia and the UK on LGBT issues or other woke culture issues more generally because I, I think they're a couple years ahead of us. They started a lot of this stuff before we did. So <laughs> I always see the madness there and you're like, oh, that could never happen here. And then a few years later, it's happening here too. So look at them as a warning. If we don't stop this stuff, if we don't arrest it in its tracks, we might end up in this kind of bizarro universe like we're seeing down under. All right, guys, now it's time for everybody's favorite part of the podcast where I subject myself to torture for your entertainment. Yeah, you're welcome, people. I know you enjoy my tears. You drink them. You have a mug. You sip them, the sweet, delicious tears. And you like watching me suffer and lose brain cells in real time as I interact with and subject myself to the craziest people from Alphabet TikTok. Make sure you like the video, subscribe, comment, and let me know what you think. And now, let's get into the first one. People want to say that I don't experience PMS symptoms. But I've been cramping incredibly bad all day. And at some point, my pain tolerance went away. And it started hurting incredibly bad for the last two hours. So much so that it made me go and throw up three times. So yeah, uh, PMS symptoms are ruining my Disney trip. Um, it's ruining my Disney trip. So... <laughs> First, my friend, I'm honestly sorry if your Disney trip is being ruined. That sounds uh, really unpleasant. Never good to get sick on vacation. That really sucks. Heart goes out to you there. But you're not having PMS symptoms because you're not having a period because you are not female. You don't have a uterus. So there is no uterine, uterine lining to be shedding, which is what a period is. So one, I just want to get you on the same page with reality because you got a case of the Delulu going on. But two, you need to see a doctor. Like something else could be going on. And that's the other problem with this kind of Delulu nonsense from trans activists on TikTok about how they have periods. You don't. So by telling yourself that, you might actually be missing symptoms of something else that you do need to see a doctor about because it sounds like you do have something going on. But what it is not is, is a period. Am I, am I going great? Like, am I, am I the one who's, who's wrong? Who's losing it? Let me know in the comments. Cause I might be missing something, but ah, I really don't like to comment on people's appearance because I don't like to make fun of people or insult them. And, and regardless, like insulting someone doesn't disprove their argument. So I try to stay away from that, but I will have to ask if you are a transgender woman, why do you have a full ass beard? That's not really helping your case. It's just kind of making you look even more confused than the words coming out of your mouth already made you sound, my dude. Oh, and before you whine in my comments, dude and my dude are gender neutral. I'm not misgendering anybody. Up next, this TikTok activist has a message yet again for the white women out there, you evil villains. Take a listen. I have a message specifically for cis white women allies, okay? I wasn't gonna be so specific, but I thought about it. You guys are literally the only people who okay? I'm wearing my work lanyard here just so you can see A, all my beautiful pins, but B, my... So beautiful. Tell me why at work, all the time, I get people going, she. Oh, what? I'm sorry, I just don't know how to pronounce. Oh, I'm just so sorry, I just don't know, I just don't know. But um, she, that one, that one, that one whose pronouns, that, that weird, that queer one. 
First of all, look with your eyes. Read. Second of all, that person, that one, point. Why do you need to make it so weird whenever you don't know someone's pronouns? Or, or here's a radical thought, ask. Who helped you today? Oh, uh, what are your pronouns? They, th them. Who helped you out today? I do not need. I don't know. I don't know. Shut up. Well, they, them seems lovely. So first, I just have to call cap on this video. Like this, at least how this person is describing it did not happen. Nobody said that queer one. That's the one that helped me. Or if they did, they're the rudest person alive. But I have a hard time believing somebody actually did that in 2024. And it's certainly not something that routinely happens to this person. I, I can promise you that. As for why they didn't read your pins, well, maybe because you have 20 of them. Right. When I see somebody covered in those pins, I don't read all of them. If they only had one, I'd probably take a look at it and scan it if I was talking to them or whatever. But when there's like 20 and they're, they've got everything uh, under the rainbow, all sorts of activist causes and slogans and weird little anime things or whatever all that is, ain't nobody got time for that. I'm not going to read all that. Sorry that happened or happy for you, but like, whatever, I'm, I'm not going to read all that. And also, even if they do see your pin, nobody has an obligation to call you they, them. Like nobody has to affirm your identity. That doesn't even make sense. In fact, I can see why many women wouldn't want to, because the concept of non-binary is rooted in, in pretty crude, misogynistic and sexist stereotypes about men and women. So I can see why women wouldn't want to participate in that or affirm that. And then... Honestly, like if you can't cope with that, it's kind of a you problem. You've kind of just got to figure out how to be okay with yourself that not everyone around you in the world is going to constantly affirm you. And if you've got a strong sense of self, you should be okay. But if you don't, you might kind of spiral like this for, for TikTok. Up next, again, they're doing the period thing. I once a month, trans women will experience what is known as a period. Some astute viewers might notice that most trans no women don't have a uterus, let alone an ovaries or anything along the lines of that. But that doesn't change the fact that they are experiencing a period. There is one of three things that work here, and two of them are the same. The main one is they're experiencing PMS. Now, people who experience PMS are anyone with a hormone cycle similar to a woman's, this includes trans women, cis women, and intersex people, or they're experiencing postmenstrual dysphoric disorder. Men can actually even experience what is similar to a period because of their hormone cycle. If a man has a high amount of estrogen in their body, they will have irritable male syndrome. I believe is what the name is called. What a fun name. Right now, not, my body doesn't have a uterus in it, but my body still thinks I you do. Right now. It's called a period. Because that's what it's colloquially known as. Linguistically, we're not going to sit there and be like, I'm PMSing every single time. We're just going to say, I'm on my period. When you're feeling under the weather, you might say, I have the flu. You probably don't have influenza. I know conservatives hate this, but it's not pedantic to say, I'm on my period. It's not wrong to say that either. It is, though. <laughs> Baby girl. <laughs> cupcake baby they it is this video just made me laugh at a couple different points like when this person said most trans women don't have a uterus most or when they said that they don't have a uterus right now what <laughs> Again, I don't need to rehash every point I already made, but it's not a period. No uterus, no shedding of the uterine lining, no eggs. Like, this is biology 101 stuff. I'm not even the best person, best situated to explain it for many reasons. Uh, but maybe leave it to the people that either have experienced this or have some sort of education or understanding in these things to explain what is and isn't, rather than spouting off this, this kind of nonsense. Up next, new sexuality just dropped, I guess. This is the polyromantic pride flag. Polyromantic is a sexuality that describes being romantically attracted to multiple genders. The pink stripe represents attraction to women. 
The green stripe represents attraction to non-binary genders. The blue stripe represents attraction to men. And the heart in the middle represents the romantic attraction component of this sexuality. I try so hard to keep it positive, to keep it moving, to not be mean. So I'll start with this. Cute dog. Love that for you. Now, how to put this? Babe, you're incoherent. There's already a name for this. There's already a label. There's already even a freaking flag. It's just called bisexual, baby girl. You don't have to make up new words, make up fake new labels. It's okay. There are two sexes, male or female. Some people are attracted to one. Some people are attracted to both. If you're attracted to both, you're bisexual. You're not polyromantic, asexual, demigod, spirit, whatever. No, I understand that maybe being bisexual is too boring and too accepted and too normalized and too tolerated for you and that you want to be oppressed. So you have to come up with something that sounds like more points on the oppression Olympic scale. I understand that, but you need to reject that impulse. And I understand that your online little bubbles have taught you that victimhood and identity are a form of currency. But that's not the way the real world works. And it's not a recipe for a happy life. Stop overcomplicating things. You're making it harder for the public to accept the LGBT community because you keep making up new words and names and concepts that people can't understand for things that already existed and already people do understand. So you're just confusing people and making them less likely to accept the community. Is that really what you're going for? Are you, are you happy about that? Are you happy with that? But hey... It might get you some likes and views on, on TikTok, um, I, I guess. Hey. Uh, what? <laughs> Nothing. Finally, and one more before I go drink my sorrows away. <laughs> um, one more TikTok, this time about J.K. Rowling, because they are just obsessed with her. Take a listen. Just a friendly reminder that J.K. Rowling is a TERF. That's a trans-exclusionary radical feminist. Now, these are feminists who despise transgender women. They don't think they're real, that a female brain can be inside a male body or vice versa. When I came out as transgender two years ago, people didn't believe it. You're such a handsome, confident guy. Yeah, but look at the writing I make. Look at the music I make. When I do my spiritual readings, what? people know that it's a female mind's eye on the other end. They can tell that it's a female writer. I find this interesting because J.K. Rowling's alias, Robert Galbraith, it took years for people to realize that it was her. I've read a lot of her books that aren't Harry Potter, and they do read like male mystery writers. Hmm. Also, Harry Potter really does capture the pubescent journey of a young boy. And transgender people um, who went through the weird. wrong puberty, they're oftentimes stuck at a prepubescent age. I'm kind of stuck at 13. I guess what I'm saying is J.K. Rowling might be- Oh? When this person threw in the I might be stuck at 13 thing at the end, this video went from funny to, to kind of sad because honestly, it doesn't seem like this person is well. So I don't really want to pick on them too much. But I'll say this. Nobody believes that trans people aren't real. They just disagree with your new definitions of gender and sex. And that's their right. And having actually looked into J.K. Rowling's views extensively, I don't believe that she's hateful towards anybody. But ironically, this kind of video actually is hateful, or at least bigoted in a way. The entire notion that there's like a feminine form of writing and art and poetry versus a male form, like what? The absolute stereotyping that's going on here as if women writers only write a certain way and men writers write a certain way and there's a feminine spirit and a male masculine spirit like all of that's pretty much made up and not real and for people who complain about the patriarchy so much you don't seem to realize how everything about you and what you're saying is is ironically reinforcing sex stereotypes that don't actually have much to do with the reality of the two biological sexes if anything, I think I'm more of a gender abolitionist than these people because, honestly, they peddle stereotypes like nobody's business. Also, a female brain being inside a male body as an explanation for transgenderism, that's debunked, guys. That's not a real thing. I can post some links 
that explain why that's that's not a real thing but that's a common talking point that you'll hear and it's it's not true it's not how any of that works all right guys that's all the alphabet people on tiktok i can handle in one sitting without incurring permanent brain damage if you got a kick out of this, if you enjoyed watching me suffer, please do consider hitting that like button and do comment with your thoughts and maybe even consider subscribing and sticking around. By the way, guys, there won't be a damage control episode next week as I'll be on vacation in Utah, so try not to miss me too much. 